I'm Richard Harris, and welcome to Real Risk, the podcast that talks to people who put themselves in harm's way. You know the type. Big wave surfers, professional soldiers, base jumpers. I'll get inside the heads of men and women who seem fearless or even reckless. They might seem crazy to us, but most are far from it. We'll be talking about putting your life on the line for something important. We're talking about real risk. Hi everyone, and welcome to this very special episode of Real Risk, the Adventure Podcast. Episode 12, wow, how did that happen? The end of the first series, and I'm absolutely thrilled with the response I've had from so many of you. The feedback has definitely been positive enough to encourage me to go around again for another series of 12 more episodes. So with that, I'm pleased to announce that you won't have to wait too long for your next weekly fix of adventure. In fact, Wednesday, September the 2nd will mark the start of Series 2, and I can promise you lots of new and exciting guests. Now, whilst the podcast has been a pretty solo effort, I didn't get to where I am today in diving without the help and mentorship of many individuals and companies. And I love to stand by the manufacturers whose equipment I use to keep me alive or comfortable on some of our big exploration dives and expeditions. And some of them give me a bit of a discount, but most importantly, all of them make really good quality equipment and give brilliant after-sales service. And that's the most important thing to me. By way of thank you, I thought I'd just give them a bit of a free shout out today. So companies like O3 Dry Suits, who have supported us for so long, uh, Kiss Rebreathers and Megalodon Rebreathers, Seacraft Scooters and Aquatica Underwater Housings for my cameras are all the brands that I um, absolutely have aligned myself with them and more than happily recommend. But there's one company in particular I want to single out, and that is Shearwater Research in Canada. Now, almost every serious cave and wreck explorer I know uses a Shearwater computer, or two even, uh, for their dives. They're totally reliable, they're almost indestructible, and for a middle-aged bloke like me whose eyes aren't the best anymore, they're crisp and bright and easy to read. But most importantly, when I'm spending over 15 hours, say, on decompressing from a cave dive to 245 metres like I did in February this year, I know that they will get me safely back to the surface. And in that respect, they're life support equipment and I trust them. So whether you're a recreational diver or a seasoned tech diver, I cannot recommend them enough. The owners, Bruce and Lynn, have become good friends and have been very generous with their support of me and my projects. So this is my way of thanking them. And in fact, I've given them a little spot in the middle of the podcast as well. Now, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't a little bit excited when I spoke to my next guest. In fact, if you ask me who I would most like to be, the answer would probably be this man, James Cameron. Terminator, Alien, The Abyss... Titanic and Avatar, the list of movies that he has inspired, written, directed or produced is stellar. But these films are not what I wanted to talk to James about. It's actually his extraordinary life as a hardcore underwater explorer, visiting deep wrecks like the Bismarck and the Titanic, or the lightless depths of the deep hydrothermal vents and the ultimate quest, of course, the Challenger Deep in the Mariana Trench, the deepest place on Earth. He has been recognised by the Explorers Club of New York, he's a Nat Geo Explorer in Residence, and he is a skilled submersible and remote operated vehicle pilot. Oh, and he seems like a bloody good bloke. So please enjoy his wonderful stories in an episode that I've dedicated to the memory of a mutual friend, Andrew White. Uh, James Cameron, this is genuinely a real treat for me and my listeners, so thank you very much for joining me. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me on the show. Now, it won't surprise you to know that I'm interested in talking to you primarily about your ocean exploration projects rather than your more famous movie projects, perhaps, although my sons will be pretty upset that we won't be talking about the Terminator and the alien (laughs) and, and all these things. But really, tell me about your love affair with the ocean and how did that begin? Well, it's interesting because I didn't grow up with the, with the ocean. Um, I grew up inland probably 350 or 400 miles from the ocean in in rural Canada. But it was at a time when the ocean was just coming into the public consciousness, the idea of underwater exploration. And of course, leading the charge, this was in the mid 60s, leading the charge was Jacques Cousteau. And he was doing his his specials and, you know, taking us all on, on one big collective dive adventure. 
and making it seem so romantic and so exciting and and almost defying the imagination that people could swim with sharks and they could uh, discover these new species. And, you know, he and his guys were running around in their silver wetsuits, you know, with scooters and diving saucers and all kinds of things. It it was like uh, science fiction fantasy coming true for me. And so I I really, that was my lens on it. And um, my personal response was to basically pester my father that I needed to learn how to scuba dive. So here I am in basically, it, it was a small village. It was technically a suburb, but it was basically in rural Canada. And the village was only 1,500 people. And there was no scuba training for, you know, miles in any direction. I eventually wound up getting trained um, in a YMCA swimming pool in Buffalo, New York. I was in Canada, and my father had to take me over to uh, a YMCA in Buffalo, New York. It was the only place he could find where they'd, they'd train us. And so here I was, a kid in high school. I was probably 15, and in with a bunch of adults in a night class. And they actually would would certify you, the equivalent of open water at the time, um, in a pool. Never did a uh, an actual open water dive, believe it or not. And I got my, uh, whatever it was, Patty or Nowie certification. This was in probably 1969 or 1970. And, uh, you know, the two, the, the, uh, the single hose, I mean, sorry, the, the, uh, the double hose, uh, Mike Nelson style uh, regulator. And it was all old school equipment. They didn't even have BCDs at the time. So it was just straps. You just literally strapped a tank on your back and and went. So the first time I actually dove in the ocean was when we moved to California. So my first open water dive was amazing, but it wasn't a training dive. It was just me with whatever I had learned in a pool going into the ocean and seeing kelp for the first time and swimming through kelp and I almost died, of course, getting tangled up in the kelp. But... uh, somehow survived all that and learned, kind of learned the hard way. It was a, it was a nascent thing at the time. You know, it wasn't the huge industry that it is now, or even that it became in the 80s and 90s. Yeah, well, by my calculations, you're 10 years older than me, and, and you started to dive exactly 10 years before I did, so we would have been the same age, about 15. Mm, yeah. And one of my one of my first instructors was a chap called Ron Allum. Who, oh, I know, um, Ronnie, very became, well. Yep. Yeah, a friend and colleague of yours. And, um, mm-hmm. in fact, there are three friends, strangely, that have kind of tied us together. Ron Ron Allum, who, who went on to help build your Deep Sea Challenger um, vessel, which uh, we'll talk about. And, uh, of course, Andrew White, a very close friend of yours and colleague who who sadly died in a a helicopter crash in 2012. But he was a well-known Australian cave diver and I I knew him through Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. cave diving. And then finally, John Garvin, who Andrew introduced me to and uh, an an amazing actor and a diver himself and who's worked with you a lot. And actually, I saw John when he was Buddy Holly in the (laughs) Hippodrome in in Birmingham in about 1992 when I was working in the UK. So, (laughs) yes, we've we've sort of strangely been uh, connected by those three people. And I have to tell you that one of those three chaps told me in a moment of... uh, uh, in tr- moment of truth, that he believed that your filmmaking re- was really uh, an excuse or a way to make money to fund your true passion, which is exploration of the oceans. Would you like to comment on that? I think there's a large element of truth to that. You know, I think I made Titanic because I wanted to go dive Titanic. So I wrote a story that the studio couldn't resist and convinced them to put up $4 million for an expedition. I told them that they were either going to spend the $4 million on visual effects to recreate the shipwreck, or we could just go film it. And uh, that the publicity value they would they would harvest for free. And they actually believed that. And I think there was a, a fairly large kernel of truth in that. I'm not sure that it would have cost us $4 million to do the, the final shots that we, uh, that we actually were able to accomplish at the shipwreck. But... Um, uh, I think the publicity value is incalculable. So uh, whether you can really support it mathematically or not, it was certainly, um, you know, Hollywood is is um, about, I think, inspiring the imagination and the idea that a bunch of filmmakers would go down to the Titanic shipwreck and shoot it for real for a, for a fictional film was kind of amazing. It was a good story hook. I think it helped us a lot in promoting the film. Uh, but yeah, no, I think there was a, a definite uh, grain of truth to the idea that, that I made that movie 
so that I could literally dive Titanic. Because I remember distinctly that when we completed the expedition and we had all the footage, I sort of thought, well, shit, now I've got to go actually make this major motion picture. <laughs> I, sort of, I sort of got the cake before I got the meal, you know. Um, but that, that was fine. It all worked out. And I did enjoy, of course, making the uh, uh, making the film. I enjoy making every film that I, you know, set my set myself to. Um, I'm pretty selective. You can see my my oeuvre isn't that great. I haven't made that many films. It's got to be something that I know I can live with for a year or two years, or in the case of Avatar, several years. It seems that your ocean exploration has, by and large, been fairly deep projects and certainly the ones that are very well known. Did you spend a lot of time exploring the ocean at, at normal depths before you got into this submersible gig? Oh, yeah. I, I think when I when I did my first submersible dives, I already had two or 3,000 hours um, underwater just in, on scuba at normal scuba depths. That would have included the abyss, where I think on the abyss alone, I logged five or 600 hours of diving and a lot of that was in helmets believe it or not because i actually directed the film from a diving helmet that was uh loosely based on the super light 17 that was developed by kirby morgan and it was uh you know the kirby of kirby morgan that developed that uh, helmet for us it was a custom deal for the film but i thought hey it works well for the actors it'll work well for me to have my voice heard underwater and be able to work so so between uh, but that's all sort of nor i mean really even though it was a helmet it was basically compressed air it wasn't mixed gas it was uh on all my diving had been probably less than um 100 meters i would say well i'm determined not to talk too much about the movies but i have to say the abyss was uh, the standout film for me in, in all of your your work and and no one will ever forget the the scenes with the liquid breathing with the mm -hmm, fluorocarbons mm -hmm. and so forth and as a, a diving medicine physician myself you know that is completely fascinating to me and can you give me the trade secret it was the rat uh, in the cage did he really uh, breathe per fluorocarbon liquid or was that all a mock-up no that was that was done for real I uh, he, uh, if you've got time for a little backstory on that when I was in high school and I had learned just learned to scuba dive I was in my uh, senior year in high school and because I had a restless mind my my uh, biology teacher said look uh, there's a uh, it was the University of Buffalo interestingly again uh, going over to Buffalo uh, was having uh, these kind of extension classes for for high school students so if you were into the sciences you could go to these classes and you know, I don't know if they offered extra credit for it or what, but I said, sure, sign me up. So uh, one, of the, one of the lectures was a uh, commercial diver named Frank Felicek. And Frank Felicek is the first human that we know of to breathe with liquid in both lungs. And it was done with highly oxygenated saline solution. And um, it, was, it was done by a guy named Dr. Kilstra. Well, so Kilster was doing these experiments, and including on humans, but also in rats and, and uh, dogs and primates and so on, with fluid ventilation, liquid ventilation. And he quickly graduated to the, uh, the fluorocarbon emulsion because of its oxygen uptake. And I'm sure you know some of this stuff, but I'll, I'll, I'll do it for your listeners, that um, there's a 3M material, uh, it's a fluorocarbon, that's relatively inert to the human body it, it doesn't uh, doesn't seem to have any um, biological effects but it's able to hold about 20 times more oxygen than water so it's a great transport mechanism for getting oxygen into the lungs for uh, liquid ventilation or liquid breathing so these guys were experimenting with this back in the 60s and the early 70s and that experimentation went on through the 80s and 90s actually and Johannes Kilstra led the charge, but a lot of other researchers got into it. So when I wrote The Abyss, I originally wrote it in high school, believe it or not, after I, after I saw this lecture. And I included the liquid breathing in the story. I've since lost the short story that I wrote. I just can't seem to find it. But I remember it quite clearly. And it was about people going down a wall in some tropical place. I was thinking of Grand Cayman because I knew there was a deep wall there. And they were going down thousands of feet. They were scientists in my original story. 
and they were going on this um, on this fluid breathing deep diving system because I understood enough of scuba gas physiology to understand that there are real depth limits in terms of decompression and and um, and so on and that the liquid breathing seemed to offer a decompression free uh, system and that's still the case by the way I, I you know I've done a, a lot of research on it over the years and I've been involved with people that have actually literally wanted to develop a system for real uh, quite recently and there don't seem to be any serious barriers to actually doing it other than funding uh, and maybe animal testing at, at this stage of the game the ethics of animal testing have changed so much that that might be a barrier but you could really do it um, so the way we did it in the film was we simulated it with Ed Harris. I know I've got a reputation as being rough on actors, but I didn't require Ed to actually breathe the oxygenated fluorocarbon. Um, but we did require little Beanie the Rat to do it. He didn't get a vote in it. And so what you see in the movie is a real thing. We put him in that... Um, it was supposed to be like a part dip tray, just happened to be a little wire mesh cage, and they pop the rat into that and they submerge him. What you're seeing was the real thing. And the way I did it was I went to Johannes Kilstra. I tracked him down. He was at Duke University, which turned out to be less than 100 miles away from where we happened to be filming The Abyss, believe it or not. So I literally just drove over there and I said, tell me how to do this. I want to do it with a rat. And he said, well, you, you heat it up to the rat's body temperature. You oxygenate it with an aquarium bubbler for about 10 hours ahead of time. Make sure it's well perfused with oxygen. And then you pop the rat into it and make sure that, that he has his feet down and his head up, which allows the fluid to, to, to pour down into the lung. And he'll transition into fluid breathing. And I said, great, I'm going to do it. So we did it with five rats. And every time a rat was finished with a take, we took him out. And I, had, I did exactly what Kilstra told me. I picked him up by his tail and I let, the, I let it drain out. And his natural breathing just pumped the, the fluid out. And he transitioned back to air breathing and, and they were fine. Except for rat number five. Rat number five came out and he was just a limp. He was the deadest looking rat I ever saw in my life. So I re and the entire crew is watching. And this is like you never harm an animal for a movie. You know, it's like, oh, my God, I got a dead rat. So I reached, I put my hand around the little rat's rib cage and I gave him rat CPR. I just, I just palpated his rib cage at a, at a high rate like this. And the fluid shot out of his nose and he gasped and he came back to life and kind of shook himself off and he was fine. And he became my pet. So I had Beanie the rat as a pet for the next couple of years. They don't live very long. And he died of old age. I'm not sure he ever forgave me. Well, I don't think Beanie knew what you did to him to, to get <laughs> no, him to that point. But no, I don't think so. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. And I could just talk about the perfluorocarbon stuff for the rest of the podcast, to be honest, sure, because there's sure. so many medical and uh, you know military and other applications for this stuff that are yep. coming to light. And yep. uh, I, I had the pleasure of listening to a guy called, uh, I think it's Bruce Space, who... Uh, uh, an American guy who came to one of our diving medicine conferences and we talked about it for the whole conference. Mm -hmm. It was extraordinary. Mm -hmm. But uh, unfortunately, most of our listeners might not be interested in the, okay. the subtleties of, of, right. of that, so we better move on. So the deep exploration side of your, your life, um, obviously there's a fascination with the deep ocean. Yeah. Um, did that Was that a necessary evil because of the Bismarck project where you, you dived and filmed that wreck at, what was it, 16,000 feet? Sure. Pretty close to 5,000 meters. You know, look, I've been fascinated by the deep ocean for a long time, uh, really since high school. In, in my mind, there's space and there's inner space, and they're kind of equal. And, and what fascinated me, as much as I love scuba diving, um, you know, coral reefs or kelp beds, and there's so much beauty and there's so much wildlife, such amazing fauna, it's what hasn't been seen that is the most interesting to me. So just going and seeing things that others, others have experienced and photographed and so on, while it's fascinating, it's enriching to me personally, as it is, I think, to any diver, I always want to go beyond. And I want to see the thing that people haven't seen. And I know that you as a cave diver, I know cave divers want to see that thing that people haven't seen, want to go into that space, that cave system that's never been seen and have those new experiences and be at the cutting edge. You're really at the cutting edge of human experience for everyone because you bring the story back and you bring the images back. And uh, I thought uh, 
that I was born to do this. When I started doing the research for the abyss, I was basically a fan. I wanted to learn more about it. I wanted to learn about the robotic systems and the lighting systems and so on because you get down much below 500, 600 feet in the ocean. There's no light. You're out of the photic zone. Uh, now, actually, there are creatures that can that can see down to 1,000 or 1,500 feet, you know, probably, probably even as deep as 1,000 meters, uh, which is why bioluminescence works because it's used to uh, disguise and distract and so on. Um, but... Um, you know, I, I knew that there was so much down there that hadn't been seen that, that we'd really just barely scratched it. So when I did the abyss, I became familiar not only with the tools of the trade, the, the deep sea robotics um, and lighting systems and so on, but I became familiar with some of the people. So Dr. Robert Ballard, who found the Titanic, for example, famous oceanographer, and he was um, he was basically at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in Massachusetts. And I got to know some of his engineers and some of the people there, some of whom are still there and still close friends of mine, like uh, Andy Bowen, uh, who built a, uh, a vehicle that goes to the, the deepest places on the planet called Nereus. And so, um, you know, when I got to know them and I thought, wow, this, I could do for real what we only showed fictionally in the abyss. It didn't strike me as more complicated than the than the most complex movie productions I'd been involved in, which involved fairly high levels of engineering, fairly high levels of, of engineering team kind of integration, building complex systems and so on. I thought, wow, I could do this for real. I could go to the Titanic, make a film there. How cool would that be? Um, and then so, you know, so the abyss led to making Titanic and then making Titanic led to future expeditions, which included Bismarck. And then I started to get fairly serious and fairly rigorous about the science side of it, because I felt the deep ocean, the science of the deep ocean is not well funded. There's just not a lot of money there. It's kind of the opposite end of the spectrum from space, space travel and space research. Um, and that's because, you know, Big governments love to spend money on space because what falls out of that is so much technology that can go into weapon systems. And that's not so true um, in oceanography. It used to be with the development of submarines and, and deep acoustics and um, underwater navigation, communications, things like that. But the military is so specialized in terms of, of uh, you know, fighting submarines. They don't kind of they don't kind of care too much about the biology anymore and the and the geology. Um, so it's not, it doesn't work like space travel and there's just kind of no money there. So I thought it's really immoral of me to be spending millions of dollars to be going to the deep ocean to, to, to shoot these films just out of my curiosity and to bring it back for the curiosity of the viewers if I don't bring the scientists with me. So I made, I made myself a pledge to do what Cousteau did. Cousteau always brought scientists with him and the only thing he charged them was one thing. They had to publish. If he if he went if they went with him on Calypso to a place, they had to publish, and so I just made the same deal with scientists. And pretty early on, you aligned yourself with the Russian uh, research vessel, the Academic Keldish. Yeah. If I've said that even vaguely correctly. Yeah, correct. Uh, with those two famous submersibles, the the Mears. Yeah. And I feel like I've known about this ship and and that crew and those subs for so long but I think it's all through your your projects how did you meet up with those guys well it's an interesting story it almost it almost feels uh, supernatural in a way uh, when I think about it in retrospect it's very bizarre I hadn't been thinking about Titanic I've never really uh, before so I'm gonna I'm gonna set the scene here um, it's 1992. I've just made this huge hit film. It's been a hit around the world, Terminator 2. I'm sort of looking around for new projects, just thinking the wheels are just turning. You know, I could do this, I could do that. And um, just kicking around the house one day and I look across my shelves and I pull down a, uh, this was in the days of VHS. I pulled down a VHS tape of A Night to Remember. I'd seen it maybe as a teenager, as a kid made 1961 black and white film uh, based on Walter Lord's book about the sinking of Titanic and uh, kind of, you know, docudrama, if you will. Well made, very well made film. And I thought, you know, I haven't seen this in years. I'm just going to pop it in. 
I had known about Titanic only glancingly because when, when Ballard found it, he went down there with this little robot called Jason Jr., uh, an ROV, and I'd never heard of ROVs before, and I was fascinated by ROVs, um, inner space flying robots. You know, that's how I related to it as a sci-fi geek. And then I put ROVs in the abyss, and I told my own whole story, but then the back of my mind was, these things can go really deep and they can explore deep places. And I always remembered some of the footage of Ballard taking Jason Jr. just just a little bit inside the Titanic. And that was that was really my sole uh, anchoring point to Titanic. And, I, and something kind of clicked for me, even as I was pulling the VHS tape out of the out of the shelf. Wow. You know, maybe if maybe there's a story here um, with the present day technology and incorporating that into the history. So I popped the tape in and I watched the whole film and I, th and I thought, wow, this is a great story. This is a great human drama. And I'm immediately starting to think, oh, I can do wraparound. I can do like a present day story that brings you into a, some kind of story of intrigue that takes place on Titanic. It's a great setting. I hadn't quite gone immediately to the idea of a love story yet at that point. So I'm bursting with ideas when I when I finish this uh, this running for myself. It was the middle of the afternoon, by the way, and so I I walk you know through my house you know walking down to the kitchen to get a fix a sandwich, kind of scratching my butt, and I walk into the kitchen and there's a bunch of mail, snail mail piled on the center island, and I pick it up and I'm going through it, tossing stuff, and one of them is a, a card. I I pop the envelope open and in it is a card. And the image on the card is a solid black, uh, it's just solid black with rivets. It's the side of Titanic. And it's an invitation to a screening. And I open it up and it's my friend Al Giddings who shot the abyss for me, right? And Al had gone along to do a making of um, the, when they, when they use the Russian subs to make an IMAX film called Titanica. And I looked at this thing, and I'm, I'm literally holding an image of Titanic, the riveted hull of Titanic in my hands after just having watched literally minutes before A Night to Remember. So I think, well, I guess I better go to this damn screening. So I go to the screening. It's a couple weeks later over in Burbank, a bit of a drive. And uh, I watch the film, and it's fun. It's Al's film about how they use the Russian subs to make an IMAX film. But from about the middle of the film on, I'm thinking – if they can get those Russian subs and go to the real Titanic on the budget of an IMAX movie, which is about three to four million bucks, I can do it. They can do it. I can do it. Right? So I go up to Al after the screening. And I say, Al, we got to go to Russia. I got to meet this guy, Anatoly Sagalevich. That's the, the head of the sub program. We got to meet him. Because I saw him in the film. He's playing guitar and he's piloting the subs and doing all that stuff. And I could see that he spoke some English. I was like, we're going to meet him. And, and he said, well, when do you want to go? I said, tomorrow. He said, well, you, you can't just go to Russia tomorrow. You have to have a, <laughs> you have to get a visa. I, I'm going to have to write some letters. He said, write the letters, whatever. When, how, how quick can we do it? He said, well, I don't know, maybe next week. I said, all right, I'll get the tickets. We're going. So we went to Russia. And, you know, we quickly found out that if you want to make a deal with anybody in Russia, you're going to have to drink a lot of vodka. That is just a rule, and it's, there's no exceptions to that rule, unfortunately. So we went to Russia, we drank a lot of vodka, I got to sit in the mirrors, and I made a deal with Anatoly Sagalevich to use the subs to make a feature motion picture about Titanic. I had written not one word of the script. Wow. Yeah, so, so Al had already... Did, did Al go down to the Titanic in the Mears to make his IMAX film? I believe it wasn't Al's film. It was another filmmaker's film, but Al was doing the making of. And I believe that okay. he did make one dive to sort of film over their shoulder while they were filming the movie. And he did the same thing with us when we were out at Titanic. He came out with us to do basically the same role, to do a kind of behind the scenes or making of. Um, so anyway, so I come back and – Due to the strange machinations of this uh, production company that I was setting up at the time, I had managed to make a deal with Arnold Schwarzenegger for this little film called True Lies. And it was a pair play deal. And I wound up having to not immediately start Titanic. 
So I, I made True Lies first. In the meantime, I sort of parallel processed it in the, in the background, and I thought, I'm going to make it a love story. I'm going to do kind of a Romeo and Juliet, young love story on the doomed ship. Um, but I didn't progress with it. And Anatoly was very disappointed that I went off for a year and a half to make True Lies. And so cut to after True Lies. This is now in 1994. And I'm sitting around again thinking about what I'm going to do next. And there were a number of projects on the table. And this thing, this kind of titanic idea had been, you know, I had, I had floated that with my development people and so on. Hadn't written anything. I might have had like a treatment or an outline at that point. And the, the uh, president of my company's name was Ray Sankini. And she was sort of wondering, am I going to do this? Am I going to do Spider-Man? Am I going to do this? Am I going to do that? And I get uh, a, a fax from, I know, probably a lot of your, your listeners are young. They don't know what a fax is, but I got a fax. I think it might have even been a telex from Anatoly from Moscow. And I hadn't heard from him in like a year. And I kept this thing because it's like the page glowed. He, he had written a line in his sort of fractured English syntax that said, sometimes it is necessary in the life, meaning one's life, to do that which is extraordinary. And I read it and I thought, you know what? He's right. Sometimes it's necessary to do that which is extraordinary. So I called up Ray Sankini and I said to her, Ray, it's Titanic. And she said, okay, <laughs> uh, we don't have a script. We don't have that. I said, uh, these are details. We're going to Titanic. We're making the movie. So I went into the studio and I got this. Uh, I hope people will check this out. There's a beautiful, beautiful book of art created by Ken Marshall, who's the sort of premier artist of the, of the Titanic, of, of the, you know, the sinking of and the elegance of the ship and all that. He's brought it to life through his paintings. I got the big book um, of his paintings and I went in to Peter Chernin's office, who was the head of 20th Century Fox film at the time, and I plopped it on his coffee table and I whipped it open to a big double truck painting of Titanic sort of half sunk with its lights blazing and the, the star shells going off overhead and all the lifeboats rowing away. And I said, Romeo and Juliet on that that's it that's not that a was, bad pitch that was my pitch <laughs> so what is that Romeo and Juliet on that that's five words wow yeah <laughs> that says it that says it all yeah and that's what we did so but then now now we had to build all of those cameras and lights and robotics and everything for real to go to 12,500 feet of depth including a movie camera that could function outside the sub because I didn't want to do what the IMAX guys had done and just got to bolt my camera into the viewport. I wanted to be able to pan this thing around. I wanted to be able to tilt down and look down the sheer cliff of the side of the ship or look up that cliff-like side and maneuver it around and do cinematic shots. So we had to figure out how to pack a movie camera into a, a deep ocean housing, put it on a pan and tilt and control it from inside the sub. Nobody had ever done any stuff like that before. So I had to get I had to put my engineering hat on and get some engineers to figure it out. Power, simplicity, reliability. It's what you demand of your dive computer, and Shearwater delivers. Shearwater evolved out of one tech diver's need for a reliable, easy-to-use rebreather dive computer and quickly became the tech market leader. Now recreational divers have taken notice. The Shearwater Tarek is the best, most intuitive, and reliable wristwatch-sized dive computer on the market. Check it out in the entire line at Shearwater.com. Shearwater, dive computers for demanding divers. My brother Mike is a very, very gifted engineer, and on that first expedition in 95, he designed the, the housing for the movie camera, and we figured out how to take an Aeroflex gun camera that was probably used in a Stuka or something um, and slide it into a titanium tube and, and create a borosilicate glass front lens for it and get, you know, and have good optics and good uh, uh, and a, a proven housing that could withstand those pressures. So we're talking about, let's see, at that depth, I, I guess we're talking about somewhere around 4,000, 4,500 pounds per square inch. And uh, so he built that. 
and he also supervised the building of the pan and tilt system that allowed me to remotely operate from inside the sub. And then uh, we had another company that built the robotic vehicle for us, which was a pretty big kind of kludgy um, uh, ROV. We called it affectionately in the film Snoop Dogg. So Snoop Dogg uh, functioned, you know, it was designed to function at, at 4,000 meters. I made myself an absolute ironclad promise that I wouldn't really fly Snoop Dogg inside Titanic because we could easily lose it. It was a conventional ROV on a big umbilical, big fat power umbilical. And um, I promptly broke that promise. Once we'd, <laughs> once we'd gotten all the footage that we knew we really needed on the last dive, second to last dive and the last dive, so dives 11 and 12, we flew it inside the ship. And we saw wondrous things, wondrous things that people didn't even know existed. Um, so, and then that got the wheels turning for the next expedition and then the next one after that and so on. It becomes quite addicting to uh, discover these amazing mysteries of the deep based on engineering that you've done yourself. I'm not saying I did it myself. I, I caused it to be, to be done working with very talented engineers. All of that was so amazing, but for me, the stroke of genius from a as an underwater amateur filmmaker myself, I know this principle that you have to get the lights away from the camera yes, and to lower yes. that massive lighting rig <laughs> down from a separate ship was just uh, extraordinary, and the lighting effects of that were, were beautiful. Well, as you know, you always want to have a long baseline between your lens and your, and your lighting instrument, whatever it is, so they're not going, you're not seeing through the same water column you're lighting through. Um, so, you know, we've done a number of tricks for that uh we've had lights out on the end of a, a 12 foot telescoping titanium boom at times with a with a pan and tilt for the light on the end of the boom just kind of swung out off the side of the mirror <clears throat> naturally on the opposite side of the mirror from where my camera is so between the the length of the titanium boom and the width of the mirror submersible itself i could get the light you know uh 20 feet away which is perfect because then it, everything just looked gin clear. And then, of course, what you're referring to is the Medusa vehicle that we built from scratch for our 2001 expedition, which was my second expedition to Titanic. And we treated that as a chandelier. We just mounted every damn uh, HMI light that we could find that could withstand the pressure on that thing and dropped it down and pumped as much light as we could down on that, down on that ship and then shot it from kind of a 90-degree angle. So it looked illuminated from above by this kind of ghostly moonlight it just looked spectacular we just we loved it so much unfortunately the the medusa packed it in after two dives so we did the rest of it sort of more conventionally using the other sub as a lighting instrument um which is the advantage of two subs you know if you really want to do nice photography in, in the deep ocean make sure you have two vehicles of course I actually re-watched Ghosts of the Abyss the other night as partly for research and partly because I just, you know, who doesn't love uh, the submarine stuff? Again, I was just looking at all the lighting and I, I did notice when the big overhead lights stopped and then the second sub was became yeah. the lighting uh, yeah. source. But the, the shot that stood out for me was the light shining through those first-class dining rooms, yeah. uh, stained glass windows. That is just something that must have stuck with you forever, that image. We got pretty good... Because we had Ken Marshall on board, and I mentioned him before as this artist, but he's also this extremely detail-oriented uh, student of the marine architecture of Titanic. So I'd put him down there in a sub, and he'd literally count portholes, and he would know from the outside what cabin I was on, meaning that my ROV was that I was driving, was in deep inside the ship. He could go down to D-deck, to the D-deck level, count portholes and get that sub lined up outside the literally the cabin that I was in and put a spotlight through the window. And so what we tried to do was always have external illumination coming from the mirror while I was flying around inside the ship. And it was a godsend because first of all, it made some incredibly beautiful images. But secondly, I always had some kind of a nav beacon somewhere. I could see a light somewhere. I might have been off by one cabin because a lot of the walls have collapsed and sometimes you're just looking at a forest of studs of the remaining structure. The walls themselves, the thin wood has been eaten by wood boring organisms, but sometimes the studs remain. And so you're kind of flying through what looks like a, a half built house. 
and trying to navigate in this unfamiliar terrain. So your deck pl- you've got your deck plan in one hand and you're flying the ROV um, and, and then this spotlight would appear through the window and Ken would come on and say, we think we're at D35. And I'd say, well, then I must be in D33 and I'd move over there and we'd just play leapfrog and move the sub ahead and so on. And we got some remarkable images and it really helped with the navigation because it's very confusing in there. It's very labyrinthine obviously and it's easy to get disoriented and getting silted out and i know that you know all of this stuff and you have to you have to have a real sang froid and the same kind of feeling that you get like i'm also a wreck diver i'm not a cave diver although i i did get trained in some cave diving with wes skiles so can't imagine a better better teacher done a little tiny bit but i don't appreciate it the way you do but i've done some wreck diving and i know the consequences of a silt out and i know you guys live with this and you learn a whole methodology of easing yourself through the space with your fingertips and which is very light movement of your fins and so on so you don't silt out and can't can't navigate well it was the same thing with those rovs every time i'd touch the thruster a little plume of water would come out and it might disturb something or it might knock a rusticle down and once the room was silted out that was it so the key was to come in moving with absolute delicacy and and move very, very slowly and try to maneuver and get your images before you, you know, crap the place up too much. Exactly like cave cave photography. It's a beautiful, a beautiful part of the story when, you know, it becomes clear how attached everyone has become to those two little guys, Jake and Elwood, the ROVs. Yeah. And when yeah. one of them gets uh, caught up inside the wreck and there's a rescue mission on and at, both of them become at risk and nearly lost. I mean, it really brings in the audience to fall in love with these little guys and, and they're just you know, bits of plastic and steel, but there you go. But, the, you know, I, I always say that the, the soul of the engineer is in the, in the machine that they make you know it's kind of the ghost in the machine or the spirit in the machine and we did invest in them right and and certainly i want to talk just for a second about the experience of flying an rov like that especially going through these rooms and corridors and places that are kind of have a have a human framework to them it's a very out of body experience and your mind starts to couple the video that you see because that's all you're getting back from the vehicle is a bit of video and as you give an input to the to the vehicle to turn it, if the video turns, then everything's fine. If you give that same input and the video doesn't turn, something's touching you. Something's touching your machine body. You can't feel it, but your mind starts to create that feeling. It's almost a synesthesia where your senses become coupled. So if you give an input and the video doesn't respond like it's supposed to, you're touching something. And if you've just gone by a door frame, let's say, and you give a left turn input and you see it, you see the video kind of hitch like it's bumped something, you, after a few hours, you start to feel it like your stern is actually bumping something. And you, you process it this way. So cut to, uh, to, cut to the end of a seven hour dive with the ROV and you're deep inside the Titanic someplace, five decks down, you've got 2000 feet of fiber optic tether out, you've gone through 30 or 40 rooms, downstairs through hatches and all kinds of things. Your mind exists now in the machine. You don't feel like I was, I'm sitting in a submarine on the deck of Titanic, but I'm not. I'm inside that little machine, way down inside the ship. And I remember the feeling very distinctly when I'd fly it back out and I'd come out through a window and I'd pay out some tether and I'd come up above the deck and way over there, maybe 150 feet away, I'd see the lights of the mirror and I'd say, oh, there are those guys over there in the mirror. And I'm the guy in the mirror, (laughs) but my mind is not in the mirror anymore. It's the strangest thing, I have to say. So I can totally understand how maybe in the future, if we ever do find a way to upload our consciousness into a machine, that that, that shit's going to work. Let me just say, I know because I've felt, a, I've seen a glimpse of it. That, that stuff will work. You can have a machine body. It doesn't even have to be a human-shaped body. You're a bloody good storyteller. You should probably make some movies. <laughs> <laughs> well, isn't that what Avatar's about? Yeah, that's exactly it. And is it any coincidence whatsoever that the av- the, that the lead avatar's character's name is Jake and he's blue? <laughs> right. And you know what's, what's funny? I never thought of that. 
I didn't think of that when I when I when I was writing it. The character's name was originally Josh, and when we started the movie, I had a first AD named Josh, and there were two technical guys, two engineers on the show named Josh, and there were too many damn Joshes. They said, "All right, screw it, change the name to Jake." Okay. And the character was already blue. So, and then months later, I thought, "Wait a minute, it's a blue Jake who's an avatar." I already know that guy. You're listening to Real Risk, the adventure podcast with Richard Harris. If somebody offered me a seat on a, on a rocket into outer space to have a look at the world from up there or a seat on your deep sea challenger or on the Mir to go and look at the Bismarck or the, or the mm-hmm. Titanic, there's no question in my mind I'd be heading straight down to the bottom right. of the ocean. Right. And it is so fascinating. I feel like we really do know outer space as you know, voyeurs, you know, the armchair experts, yep. um, much so much better than than the deep ocean. So, can you give us a sense of what it was like for you the first time in a submersible you saw the Titanic come into view? Because it's such, it's part of our of our DNA almost that that wreck, yeah, uh, yeah. the story and, and the emotion that surrounds it. Can you just paint a picture for us so we can share that? Yeah, look, I'm going to I'm going to do it a little bit not the way you expect. I'm going to tell you about my second dive. And the second dive, we painted it beautifully with the sonar. We saw the ship on the sonar, we approached from the bow. We came across the 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 mud and stopped and we looked up and there was this sheer cliff above us with this very iconic prow with the bow railing and we we saw the anchor right in front of us and we came up and we came over the bow and it's the classic thing that you do to photograph titanic it's the thing that's in the movie it's the it's the approach that we took in the documentaries and so on and it never fails to impress and look beautiful that was my second dive the first dive we didn't have the sonar working and the russians hadn't been there in a few years and they were a little rusty and we came down some distance from Titanic and we had to turn our bottom sounder sideways and start pinging around randomly until we got a hit. And we saw something and we headed toward it. We got all mixed up, had no idea where we were. We got sort of silted out and we're going through a silt cloud. And ahead of us is the, the terrain starts to mound up. And I happen to know that Titanic is sitting on a, on a dead ass flat seabed. It's actually got a very slight grade to it, but it's pretty much just a flat seabed. And when I saw the terrain mounting up, I knew there was only one place within many miles in any direction that that could be. And it was the mound of debris pushed up, plowed up by the bow section when it hit, hit the uh, bottom of the ocean and drove itself in 60 feet right up to the anchors, which normally are 60 feet above the keel of the ship. And I, I said to Anatoly, it's right in front of us. And through the murk, and Anatoly was going too fast and he was coming up over this terrain. He thought it was just a terrain feature. And out of the murk ahead of us, this wall of rivets appeared and we just about hit it. And that's not the sort of romanticized view of seeing Titanic for the first time. And Anatoly thrust it upward and we, we rocketed up over the, the uh, side of the, the bow railing and he flew over it and he plopped the sub down onto the ship and we're all sort of catching our breath. And I had studied, we had built a model of the wreck based on Ken Marshall's paintings and a bunch of photographs. And I'm, I'm looking out the window as the silt clears and I see the direction of the, the decking. It's actually not the decking, it's the caulking between the, the decking because the decking has all been eaten away by wood borers. And I see a railing that's transverse to it. And I think of, I go through the whole model in my head and I say, there's only one place on the entire ship where there's a railing transverse to the line of the decking. And it's the aft end of the forecastle overlooking the forward well deck. And Anatoly says, what? No, I don't think we're there. And I, I'm pointing to him, on the, uh, pointing to the diagram. And I said, this is where we are. And he lifted up the sub, and sure enough, that's exactly where we were, and we flew over the bridge. And the rest of the dive was stellar after that, once we got our bearings. But it's not what you expect. So then the second dive was when we did it the right way. But I think the most emotional moment for me, see, I, was su- I, would, I tried to be such an astronaut. I had my shot list, and I had all my plans, and we had researched it with, uh, I mean, we had rehearsed it with the model, and I had to get, you know, I had to get my shots. I was thinking like a director slash astronaut, and I wasn't letting the emotion of it hit me. I, there was a barrier. There was an intellectual barrier, 
And I remember on the second dive, we were sitting on the boat deck and I looked out the window and I just stopped. It just, everything went out of my head. All the mission stuff went out of my head and I realized that is exactly where the band played. We were just outside the first class entrance on the port side of the ship on the boat deck. And I was looking at the spot where the band played. Wallace Hartley got his guys together, the five person orchestra, and they played until the ship sank out from underneath them to keep people calm. They played upbeat, ragtime, light airs, they called them. And uh, eventually toward the end, they played Nearer My God to Thee. And Wallace Hartley died with his violin strapped to his back. And they found his body days later in the freezing water, recovered the violin, and it's now in a museum, and you can actually go see it. That's when the emotion hit me. I got back to my cabin on the Keldish. I sat there by myself, and I just wept. It just hit me. The whole thing hit me. This wasn't some science project. This wasn't some filming exercise. This wasn't an inner space mission. This was a tragic site where people died. And if I couldn't connect to that, if I couldn't empathetically connect to that, then I had no business making that film. And I always kept that in mind while I was making the movie, that this was about people. And this is about heartbreak and loss and separation men and women separated husbands and wives children and their fathers that's the the appeal of the story and if you can't connect to that then you shouldn't be doing it so anyway so my epiphany didn't come on the first dive or my first view as one might expect there's no question when you dive a shipwreck especially one that hasn't really been um dive very much before and you see those little human things like yes. a piece of clothing yeah. or a, a book or a cup that you know someone has used uh yeah. it becomes you know very real and they're beautiful time capsules and and uh you, you can really yeah. get lost in the moment that it's great yeah beautifully put that's exactly it and i think it's the juxtaposition of being so far from human experience in an alien world in the dark bringing your lights to it and discovering something and yet seeing something familiar like you said, it might be a book, it might be a teacup. There's something surreal about sort of going to the most remote place you can imagine, and what you find there is us. Hmm. Let's talk a little bit, a little bit about the risk of these missions um, yeah. to you, to you and the crew. Um, I think it was in Expedition Bismarck. Someone made the comment that the large tilt and pan camera on the outside of the the sub hadn't really been tested, and if it was to implode, then the pressure wave might cause a, a domino effect into the sub yeah. itself. Uh, are these subs close to the limit of what they're capable of? It's unknown what um, – uh, you, you're talking about a sympathetic implosion. So you, you have a, a primary implosion that might be a smaller pressure vessel. Is the shock wave produced enough to implode the pilot sphere? And the answer is yes. The short answer is yes, but then you get into the details. How close is the pilot sphere being operated to its limits? At Bismarck, we're at 16,000 feet. The mirrors uh, are able to dive to 20,000 feet, and they have about a 25 to 30% safety margin beyond that. But that's static pressure. Dynamic pressure of a, of a pressure wave could create other effects that aren't poorly understood. Is anybody going to try to implode an expensive uh, steel sphere the Navy may have some data on this, but there's very little data in the in the deep submergence community about it. But it is well understood that sympathetic implosion is a big problem. And for example, the Nereus vehicle that I mentioned earlier, it was destroyed by sympathetic implosion. Um, they used um, uh, buoyancy spheres that were ceramic spheres, and they used a whole bunch of them in an array. And what always bothered me about that approach, which scared me for a human-occupied vehicle, was all it takes is one failing, and they all go like a string of fireworks, right? Like a lady fingers. I call it the lady finger effect. You know, pop, 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 pop. So we, didn't, we decided not to use that technology, even though Woods Hole liked that technology because it was, it was uh, cheap and you got a lot of buoyancy um, uh, without much deck weight as a penalty. So a lot of good reasons for it. But for a human-occupied vehicle, we rejected it because it didn't seem safe enough. It, it, the, the failure mode was not elegant 
you know, um, whereas, for example, we used an acrylic viewport in the Deep Sea Challenger. We knew that it was pretty much at yield. It, it, it would actually be slowly deforming during the dive, and there were a limited number of dives that we could do, but it had a graceful failure mode. It basically just kind of compressed a little bit into its seat, and the, the, the plastic would, would cold flow. You know, if I got stuck on the bottom and died and the sub was sitting down there for a few weeks, eventually that port would cold flow to the point that it, that, that it failed and the, the sphere would flood catastrophically. But I wasn't planning on being down there for weeks, and if I was, I wouldn't have cared, you know. So Ron, Ron Allum, whom you mentioned, genius engineer, he and I kind of set our own standards. We didn't try to uh, class the vehicle or certify the vehicle through the normal classification systems because we didn't believe that they would know enough about the exotic requirements to get to that kind of depth, to get to 16,500 pounds per square inch of external pressure. We had to come up with some kind of exotic new new things and new ideas, and we didn't think they would be able to, to put that through a bureaucracy bureaucratic classification system. So we said, basically, uh, you know, Ron Allum and I had a deal, you know, if you're willing to dive in it and I'm willing to dive in it with w everything that we know about deep ocean systems, which was ex very extensive by that point in both our careers, that's our certification. Because we're not asking anybody else to go but ourselves. You know, it wasn't a, a vessel that we were creating to, to bring observers down and so on. Basically, it was a one-seater. So, you know, Ronnie and I were going to do pilot training. Andrew was also willing to go through pilot training, of course. Um, you know, I mean, <laughs> there are certain people that you can count on for having a really good sense of what the risks mean, and they've thought it through, and there are no illusions, but you know in advance what their answer is going to be. And the answer is, I'm going. Yep. <laughs> I understand and I know you to... know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> it doesn't make you reckless, but it does put you in a certain class of people who are willing to take what most people would consider to be extraordinary risks and go through extraordinary steps to mitigate those risks. Because if you don't understand the risks, you can't mitigate against them. You can't engineer against those risks. And we spent seven years designing and building that sub, and there wasn't one failure scenario that we could imagine that we didn't engineer against. Now, there's always that X factor. There's always the thing you didn't imagine, that you didn't see coming. And that's true of any human endeavor, but that shouldn't hold you back. No, definitely not. I was very lucky to um, do a little bit of work with John Garvin mm. in designing your heated underpants. You <laughs> not I've known about my involvement in that. But well, through thank our, you. Thank you. <laughs> through our, my, through my frozen ass <laughs> thanks you. <laughs> Through our diving in uh, the six degree temperature waters of this cave in New Zealand that we've been exploring for many years, yep. you know, we'd been working with this company in the UK, a motor, motorbike um, mm -hmm. heated garment company to, to make our heated underclothes and John Garvin knew about this and he said, Harry, do you, have you got any ideas about how we keep James warm in the sub if it gets stuck on the bottom? So uh, the, the long story short is I've ended up with two pairs of your heated socks. <laughs> the heated socks were good. Those I used. So the interesting thing is I was bunched up in well, – first of all, as a cave diver, you know how important hypothermia is. You get, you get hypothermic and your hands don't work anymore. You literally lose functionality. Your brain starts to not work as well, and the risk factors start to go up on a kind of a log curve. Um, the big risk in deep submergence is not running out of air, generally speaking. Usually the life support systems are fairly simple, fairly straightforward. You take lots of oxygen, and as long as you've got CO2 scrubber, you're generally in pretty good shape for about 80, or 80 to 100 hours, uh, which is you'll freeze to death in that time because the, the sub will cold soak. The sub, these subs don't have heaters. That's, it sounds kind of counterintuitive, but you don't want to waste a lot of energy of your precious battery trying to, tr trying to heat a s steel sphere that's got ice water on the opposite side of it. It's just a losing game. You'll dump all your battery energy out into the ocean and you won't get anything done. Your lights will run out of power and you'll have to come back in just a couple hours. So they don't waste time heating the subs. It's an interesting thing that the the CO2 scrubber is an exothermic reaction, chemical reaction. So it's dumping heat into the uh, 
into the sphere the whole time. And we were also dumping heat from the, um, what were they? Oh, the, the ballasts for the lights. So we were using these big HMI lights and the ballasts were internal. So the ballasts were dumping heat. So we had plenty of waste heat from our electronics, from our ballasts and from our, from our air scrubber in the mirrors. We were always warm enough until we turned around and came home and you'd have a two or three hour ascent and you'd freeze your tush off at that point. Now in the deep sea Challenger, we had to, you know, it was a very tiny sphere. So you were very close to the edges of the sphere. And, um, once you shut the electronics off, or if you ran out of power, if you had a battery failure, and if you were stuck down there, you'd be dead in about 10 hours. And uh, so we thought, look, a little thermal insulation is going to go a long way. So that's where you got into it with the uh, electrically warmed um, uh, clothing, right? And then we put a thermal layer over that. I didn't typically wear that during the, the during the dive because I had so much waste heat from my camera systems and so on that it kept me warm. Um, John referred to to me as a human thermocouple because I had my feet sitting on the hatch, which was bare steel, right? And my head was up against the backside of the sphere, which is bare steel. So my head was freezing and my feet were freezing and the center of me was warm. Yeah, so I had a look inside the sphere. It didn't look uh, particularly spacious or, or comfortable, no, but um, no, no. nonetheless, I was still I was still jealous of your, your efforts. It was neither one, I assure you. <laughs> For those listening, uh, you know, the story in short is that James Cameron built basically a homemade submarine and went to 35,798 feet into the Challenger Deep, which is the deepest part of the Mariana Trench. And um, he did that after Don Walsh and Jacques Picard did that in 1960-something. Yep. Yeah, it was 1960. Yeah. yeah, January 23rd, 1960. And they had a vehicle that was basically a giant steel balloon filled with gasoline because in the same way that a balloon uses hot air or hydrogen to float relative to the denser air outside, gasoline is lighter than seawater. So if they just made a big enough enclosure filled it with gasoline, it could float. So why do we care about what can float? Well, it turns out that nothing that you normally think of as floating will float at the bottom of the, at, at those kinds of depths. Wood will quickly impregnate because of the, the pressure with water and become negative. Anything that you can think of is going to go negative or get, get compressed to the point that it's negative. So it's very hard to find something that's going to make your sub float. So obviously the sub's made out of steel. You've got a steel sphere. There are negative elements. So they ha there has to be positive buoyancy in order to achieve neutral buoyancy at the bottom. If you don't have neutral buoyancy, you can't drive around. You're going to just sit on the bottom like a cinder block. And then how are you going to get back? Right, so you have to go down there with more weight than you need to survive and drop some, and then you can float back to the surface. And so you've got to have flotation. So the art of deep flotation is a big was a big part of our technical challenge. And Ron Allum, whom whom you've mentioned, who who you know I maintain is a, a genius and a polymath across across um, mechanical engineering, design, material science, and electronics. He knows it all. Uh, he's an amazing guy, a great collaborator. Uh, Ronnie had to come up with the flotation system or the flotation material for the sub. And so we used the basic principle of syntactic foam, which is little tiny microspheres of glass, hollow glass spheres that float in an epoxy matrix. But Ronnie took it a step further and he impregnated it with um, fibers, very strong polymer fibers, and he increased the tensile strength of the material to about threefold. And because I had challenge him with the principle that we're going to we're going to not build a steel frame and put a big block of flotation on top of it we're going to build the sub structurally out of the flotation material which nobody had ever done it was kind of like a monocoque racer back in the 60s it was a radical idea you don't put a chassis don't put a body on a chassis you build it all as one uniform structure it was the same concept and the object there was to save weight the other stroke of genius from my point of view was the fact that you took this long submarine, so almost a submarine shape, but turned it on its end to make it drop like a, a pin yeah. drop, like a dart, which yeah. is so intuitive in retrospect, but so brilliant. Yeah, we, yeah like a lawn dart. You, know, you just drop it. It's going to go really fast. Well, the logic on that is I, I'd had enough experience with, with deep submergence at the time that I knew that what you really do is you make this long descent and then because these subs move slowly and because you're, you're moving slowly so that you can find 
uh, uh, biological samples or rock samples or whatever, you're not racing around. You're moving relatively slowly and you probably never go more than about a half a mile, maybe a mile at the most. So let's say a mile. And we were going down seven miles and up seven miles and doing a one mile traverse. So the ratio was 14 to one, vertical versus horizontal. So if you're going to be hydrodynamic, which direction do you want to be hydrodynamic? Mm. Vertically. So the idea was let's make a vertical torpedo and let's take that battery power and that um, the length of time that we can be comfortable enough to, to not be screaming inside this little tiny sphere and let's use it not in the vertical part of the water column, but to explore horizontally on the bottom. So the idea was to get through that vertical water column as fast as we could, explore at our leisure at the bottom, and then race back up. And that's why we wound up with this strange configuration. There are a couple of examples in nature. A seahorse, for example, is, is a sort of vertical fish, mm -hmm. if you think about it, with little fins on the back that pushes it through the, through the water. And there are other examples of fish that move vertically through the water as opposed to you know the typical horizontal configuration uh, there's one question i do want to ask you and it, it sounds flippant but it's actually very serious is what did your wife say when you said you were going to go to the challenger deep well susie's kind of remarkable she comes from a family of pilots she's a pilot herself she understands risk and she understands risk mitigation and when we got married she, in her vows she said that she would back me no matter where I wanted to go in the universe. Now, at the time, I had been talking about going to the Mir space station and then later to the International Space Station on a Soyuz, and I was in negotiations to do that and shoot a 3D film there. That's what she was thinking, and as a pilot, she could relate to that. When I told her I was going to the Challenger Deep, she blanched. But she remembered what she'd promised, and she basically said, I support you. And in fact, she was with us on, on the expedition, at least for the, for the Challenger deep dive, not for the earlier dives in the New Britain Trench and so on. We did a series of those 11 dives, um, and the, the Challenger deep dive was the, uh, I believe it was the 10th dive, um, and she was there for that one. And I think she was scared. I think she was apprehensive, but she was very stoic about it, and she took it in stride because she knew that that's who I was. Uh, she knew that as a pilot, she took risks that other people might not understand. And she came from a family of people who understood risk and understood that you mitigate against risk. You take risk very seriously. You don't take it recklessly. I mean, the idea of jumping out of a perfectly good air, aircraft to me doesn't make a lot of sense. But then a lot of things I do don't make sense to people that might be perfectly happy skydiving. So. Well, it all makes very good sense to me, Jim, and um, all I can say is thank you again for your time. I'd actually like to dedicate this episode to our friend Andrew White, who was so important in everything you did and uh, was a great mentor to me as well. So yeah, um, it's been fantastic to talk to you, and I wish we could have another hour, but uh, I'm, I'm sure Maybe you've got some work to do. Just invite me back sometime. There's still so much we haven't talked about, and thanks for dedicating the hour to Andrew. He's the person that sort of glues that whole group together that you mentioned. I met John Garvin through Andrew. I met Ronnie uh, Allen through Andrew, and I met you through John Garvin. So, you know, the thing that the six degrees of separation all come back to Andrew White. That's right. And I've got your socks. So, <laughs> okay. All right. Well, <laughs> we have a lot more to talk about. Thank you, Jim. All right. Thank you. That's it for this episode of Real Risk. If you're a risk taker or know someone who'd be good for the show, please send me an email on admin at speleopix.com.au. I'd love to hear from you. Let me know what you think of the podcast. Subscribe, give me a rating, but most importantly, join me for the next one. We'll see you again on Real Risk. Real Risk.